السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا وقرة أعيننا محمد بن عبد الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في قرآنه العزيز بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون وقال تعالى أيضا يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدا وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن all praise and thanks be to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is our creator, sustainer, nourisher, protector and curer. We ask Allah the Almighty to shower his choicest of blessings and salutations upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family members, his companions and all those who tread upon his path with utmost sincerity until the day of Qiyamah. First and foremost, I admonish myself and then all of you all present here to adopt a life of taqwa. And that is to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during every single second of our lives if we wish to attain success in this world as well as the hereafter. As our powerful maker states in the Noble Quran, that indeed for the people of taqwa is mafaza, is success, is victory. Scholars rahimahumullah explain that success in this world as well as the hereafter has been sealed off for the people of taqwa. May Allah the Almighty make us all from the people of taqwa. Because after all, taqwa is the ultimate goal behind Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creating us. Fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate goal behind Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creating us. Allah the Almighty states in the Noble Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That I, did, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is stating this, that I did not create jinn kind nor mankind for any other purpose other than ibadah, other than the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in another place he states, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ عَبُدُوا رَبَّكُمُ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ O mankind, worship your Lord, the one who created you all and the ones before you all. Now comes about the ultimate reason, the goal. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you'll adopt taqwa. So that you'll become people of taqwa. So that you'll ad- adopt the fear and the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah the Almighty make us all from the people of taqwa. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, our deen is so beautiful. Islam is such a beautiful religion that whatever we do, if we do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we do it in accordance with the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it becomes an ibadah. Now when we say, وَمَا خَلَقُتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that I have not created jinn kind nor mankind for any other purpose other than ibadah, that does not mean that we have to devote our whole lives in the masjid perhaps, or that we have to spend our whole lives in sajda, in prostration unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, rather every single thing that we do in our lives, if we obey the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if we stay away from the prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever we do seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in accordance with the teachings of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it becomes an ibadah. We are rewarded for it. Allahu Akbar. Likewise, if you take nikah, nikah, marriage, even marriage, 
The minute we follow the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and at the very inception, if our intention is that we are doing it purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it becomes a great ibadah, a great ibadah. The whole marriage, that bond becomes an ibadah. It becomes a worship. We are pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we are entering into the halal bond of marriage to protect ourselves from that which is haram. To protect that for ourselves from that which is haram and to indulge in that which is halal. So no doubt, even the consummation of marriage, even making love in marriage, we are rewarded for it by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how beautiful our religion is, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam. Allahu Akbar. And it is extremely important that whatever we start off in our lives, we put our intentions proper. Number one, primary the most important thing is that we have to put our intentions proper. Because as we all know, our deen is based upon intentions. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, in a, in a, This is a very famous hadith, which is recorded in many books of a hadith. In a, that actions are but by their intentions. In a, in a, Actions are but by their intentions. And every man, every individual will get that which he has intended. Allahu Akbar. Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah is reported to have said that this hadith, this hadith innamal a'malu bin niyat until the end constitutes half of our deen. Because it is such an important hadith that we put our, we rectify our intentions always that whatever we do, we're doing it for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say for example, we are about to enter into uh, the, the, a beautiful bond of marriage. Now we need to check our intention as to why we are entering into this bond of marriage. Why? Is it because my parents are forcing me? Or is it because of some monetary gain? Is it perhaps because my father-in-law is loaded? Or is it because I'm going to get a BMW 5 Series perhaps? Or an, a house in Colombo 7? What is the intention behind going into this bond? Of, or is it because I love the girl? I'm having an illicit relationship with her. I've been in love with her for the past 5-6 years. Now it's high time we get together. What is the intention? We need to put our intentions right if we want to be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you're marrying for the five series, then it's going to be for the five series. The minute the five series is in the garage, so will your marriage be. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam states in the same hadith, وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ امْرِئٍ مَا نَوَى Every man, every individual will get what he intended. Allahu Akbar. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes on to say, فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَإِلَى رَسُولِكَ He whose migration was for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for Allah's messenger, then his migration will be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The narration goes along the lines of these words. And he whose migration was for some worldly gain, Say you are in Mecca, you are migrating to Medina because you feel you can do a good business or you can strike a good deal there in Medina. If you are making hijrah for a worldly gain, or Rasulullah went on to say, or if you are making hijrah for a woman, if you are making hijrah for a woman, you know so and so is in Medina, if I make hijrah there, I can marry her. If your hijrah is for that woman, then your hijrah will be either for that worldly gain or for that woman. It will not be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will not be for the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is of utmost importance that whatever we do, whether it be salah, whether it be our zakah, whether it be our sawm, whatever ibadah, likewise our marriage, whatever we do, we need to put our intentions proper. We need to have high, noble intentions because many, many a great deed Many a great deed is diminished. Many a great deed is diminished because of a, a cheap intention, because of a lowly intention. And many a small deed, many a small and trivial deed is magnified, is amplified because of a noble and high intention. So let us have beautiful intentions because we are rewarded for our intentions. We are rewarded for our intention. This is how beautiful Islam is. Right now, in this gathering, if all of us, if all of us were to intend in our hearts, Ya Allah, 
If I have a million dollars with me right now, if I have a million dollars with me right now, I would dish it out in charity. I would feed the hungry. I would feed the poor. I would give people in marriage. I would build masajid. I would build hospitals for the poor. I would build libraries. I would fund the students of knowledge. If you keep this intention right now, just right now, it's not going to take you a second. If you just intend, Ya Allah, if I, sincerely, if I have a million dollars, I would dish it out in charity. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, on the day of Qiyamah, you will be amazed. On the day of Qiyamah, when your book of records is given on your right hand, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala arrange for all of our books of records to be given on our right hands. Because if we are given it onto our right hands, then we are indeed successful. You will open your book and you will be amazed. You will see a transaction of a million dollars. You will be amazed because you might think, I've never seen a million dollars in my life. How did this come into my book of records? It will be because of that noble intention you had, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam. If you intend sincerely, it will be recorded in your book of records as a good deed. This is how powerful intentions are. So let us put our intention right before we do anything. And especially before we enter into the bond of marriage. Because the bond of marriage, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, nikah is a beautiful bond of marriage that has been sealed off in the heavens. It has been sealed off in the heavens. It has been decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heavens. And who was the matchmaker? The matchmaker was none other than our beloved maker, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This bond starts off in this dunya and it must continue and travel on to the akhirah. It must go on for an eternity. That is the intention we must all have that we are entering into this bond of marriage for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, solely for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not for any other reason other than the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that we also pray to Allah the Almighty that He strengthens the bond of marriage and makes it last for an eternity. So number one, you, we have to put our intentions proper. Number two, let me share with you all a beautiful story about Ummu Darda radiallahu anha, a very famous Sahabiya, a very famous female companion of our beloved master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She was the wife, she was the beloved wife of Abu Darda radiallahu anha who was also a famous companion of our beloved master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is to highlight, this story is to highlight the beauty of love and mercy in a marriage. And this is what we must aspire for. Once Salman al-Farisi, Salman the Persian, radiallahu an, you see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after hijrah, what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did was that the muhajirun, the ones who emigrated from Mecca, he made them brothers. He made them brothers with the Ansar, the Ansar of Medina. So Abu Darda radiallahu anhu was an Ansar, was made the brother of Salman al-Farisi, Salman the Persian radiallahu anhu. They were both brothers through Hijrah. They were bro both brothers, brothers in Islam. So one day Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu was passing by the house of Abu Darda radiallahu an, and he sees Umm Darda radiallahu anha looking very shabby. She was dressed very shabbily. So he asks her, Ya Umm Darda, Oh Umm Darda, why is it that you look so shabby? Then she states, Well, your brother, he has no interest in dunya. He has no interest whatsoever in dunya. In other words, Abu Darda, she's talking about her husband. He has no interest whatsoever in dunya. Then Salman al-Farisi radiallahu an, he got the message. So he goes to Abu Darda radiallahu an, and he takes some food with him, and he goes to Abu Darda radiallahu an, and puts forward that food. The minute he puts forward the food, Abu Darda radiallahu an, who says, Ya Salman, I am fasting. I am fasting an optional fast. Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu, he states, No, I want you to eat with me because if you don't eat with me, I'm not going to eat. If you're not going to eat with me, I'm also not going to eat. So it's an optional fast. You are permitted to break it whenever you want. So Abu Darda radiallahu an, because of Salman al-Farisi, because he loved him a lot, he broke his fast to partake of the meal with him. Now don't think it's strange, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam. It's not like the Sahaba, Ridwanullah ta'ala alayhi majma'in, used to have fancy breakfast, lunch and dinner. No, 
at times they used to get meals very rarely so when they got a meal they would love to partake of it together and that is why he broke his fast and started to partake the meal with Salman al-Farisi radiallahu an so the night approaches night approaches and Salman al-Farisi radiallahu an now he goes he stays with Abu Darda radiallahu an and he as they went to sleep, he sees that Abu Darda radiallahu anhu was not going to sleep. He started getting ready to pray. He started to get, he started getting ready to pray. Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu then instructs Abu Darda radiallahu an, Oh Abu Darda, I want you to sleep. I want you to sleep. And then he comes and sleeps. And then he tries to get up in the middle of the night. He says, no, still sleep, sleep. You have to sleep further. And then he goes on to sleep. And until it was the last third of the night, Abu, uh, Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu then wakes Abu Darda radiallahu anhu and tells him now get up and now pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then he tells Abu Darda radiallahu anhu oh Abu Darda your body along the lines of these words your body has a right over you your body has a right over you in other words you need to feed your body it is not upon you to fast every single day and you, know, you should also get some rest you should also get some sleep likewise your wife has a right over you. You should spend time with your wife. This is also very, very important. Because when we look at the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was the best teacher. He was the best commander. He was the best leader. He was the best husband. He was the best towards children. He was the best neighbor. He was the best in everything. Allahu Akbar. He was an individual, the greatest of all prophets, the seal of prophets. He was shouldered with so much of responsibility, but he had time to spend with his wives. He had time to spend with children. He had time to treat his neighbors well. Then why don't we? It is not like we are involved in ibadah 24-7. Nor are we managing multi-trillion dollar business industries. Why can't we spend time with our children? Why can't we spend time with our wives? We want our lives to become success stories. We want our marriages to become success stories. But we are not ready to follow our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa whose life was the biggest success story ever. Allahu Akbar. His life was the biggest success story. If we follow his life, if we follow his teachings, no doubt we are also going to be successful in this world as well as the hereafter. So coming back to Umm Darda radiallahu anha, her husband passed away before her. So at, during his deathbed, when he was on his deathbed, when he was close to death, Umm Darda radiallahu anha, she goes to her husband and then she tells him, O oh Abu Darda, in this world you came and asked for my hand in marriage. You asked for my hand in marriage from my parents and I accepted and we got married. Likewise, I want you on the day of Qiyamah, when we are in Jannah, I want you to come and ask for my hand in marriage and let us get married. Allahu Akbar. You see their life, both of them, their lives were not full of luxuries. Their lives were not full of comfort. Rather, their lives were full of hardship. And that's why Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu saw her dressed very shabbily. Because they understood the reality of this world. They understood the reality of this life. How temporary, how transitory, and how futile the life of this dunya is. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, let me give you all a calculation. Let me give you all a calculation just to wake us all up from the haze that this dunya has intoxicated us in. You know what our beloved master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is reported to have said in regard to the lifespan of this ummah? The lifespan of this ummah is from 60 to 70 years. That's it. Allahu Akbar. If someone were to live past 70, it would be considered a miracle these days especially. If a person were to live past 70, 70, 80, it would be considered a miracle. So 60, 70 years is the average lifespan of an individual. So let's take an individual who has 60 years of life. 60 years of life. Okay, 60 years. Now, this is a question I wish to ask you all. How many hours do you think an average adult sleeps for a single day? Just an average adult, how many hours does he sleep for a single day? Eight, yeah, eight hours. Let's take it at eight, six hours in the night, and perhaps two hours siesta in the afternoon or a small afternoon nap, eight hours. From 24 hours, eight hours is one third. 
So out of that 60, one third of it we spend sleeping. So one third of 60 is 20. 20 years of our lives we spend sleeping. 20 years. So how much have we got remaining? 40 years of our lives. 40 years. So out of this 40, let's minus the, the, the span where we haven't attained maturity, where we haven't attained buluv, we haven't attained puberty, because we are only held accountable after we attain maturity, after we attain puberty. So on an average, a normal youngster attains puberty at the age of 15, even though these days with all the hormonal foods, they even attain age at the age of 10, but let's keep it at 15. So 40 minus 15, how much is remaining? 25. 25 years. So from this 25 years, how many hours do you think an average adult works? 8, 10 hours, yeah? So I'm not going to give you the accurate calculation over there, but we have even workaholics who work 12 hours, 16 hours, 18 hours. We have workaholics, yeah? They, you know, they work a lot, mashallah. So anyway, let's keep it from that 25 years, let's minus a 10 years. A 10 years spending, earning a livelihood, which all of us do naturally, yeah? So 10 years minus from 25, how much have we got remaining? 15 years. So 15 years, breakfast, lunch, dinner, every single day, and at times we have meetings and all of these stuff, yeah? Breakfast, lunch, dinner. So out of the 15 years, let's minus five years for every single day we spend time eating, drinking, five years. How many years have we got remaining now? 10 years. Now, spending time with the family, going out, perhaps recreational activities, hanging out with your friends, you know, once in a while checking your news feed on Facebook and all of these stuff. Five years, you know, going out on trips and foreign trips and all of that stuff. Five years. How much have we got remaining now? Five years. Don't you think that at least we should devote that five years for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is how temporary and this is how transitory this dunya is, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam. If you are 30 years old in this gathering, know for a fact that you may last for another 30 or 40 years. If you are 40, another 30 or 40. If you are 50, another 20 or 30. And that too, none of us can guarantee. I gave you the example of an individual who has been blessed with 60 years. Who in this gathering can guarantee that we will live till 60? None of us. If I were to ask, none of us would be able to lift our hands. None of us can guarantee whether we would even last till we exit the masjid. Allahu Akbar. What if Malakul Mouth is waiting to welcome us? The question that we need to ask ourselves, are we ready to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are we ready to meet Malakul Mouth? Are we ready? So this is how temporary and transitory this dunya is, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam. They, actually, there is no point in hankering behind dunya. There is no point in amassing millions. There is no point in buying expensive houses and mansions. There is no point in running around in expensive motor vehicles, even though none of it is haram. But we need to get our priorities straight. We need to get our priorities straight. Are we going to live here forever and ever? Nay! We are crossing over a transitory stage. We need to be securing investments that will reap great rewards for us in our perpetual and eternal residence, which is Al-Akhirah, which is Jannah. Remember, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, the only size of regret of the dwellers of Jannah will be that, oh, I should have said one more Subhanallah. I should have said one more Alhamdulillah. I should have said one more Allahu Akbar. Because if I had done that, a tree would have been planted in my orchards in Jannah. A tree would have been planted in the gardens of Jannah. This would be the only sadness. This would be the only regret of the dwellers of Jannah. Because a'mal has been made so easy upon this ummah. We just utter a dhikr, a remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we are rewarded so much. Allahu Akbar. A famous hadith. This hadith is at the end of the book of Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, Kalimatani khafifatani ala al-lisan Thaqilatani fil mizan Habibatani ila rahman Subhanallah wa bihamdi Subhanallah al-azim 
a beautiful hadith, Allahu Akbar. Two statements, light on your tongue. Two statements, light on your tongue, heavy on your scales, heavy on your scales of good deeds. And most beloved unto Ar Rahman, the most merciful. And what are those two statements? Subhanallah wa bihamdi, Subhanallah al Azim. Subhanallah wa bihamdi, Subhanallah al Azim. Why? Why is it difficult for us to moist our tongues with these beautiful adhkar, resulting in us reaping great good deeds, inshaAllah ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all to moisten our tongues and our hearts with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Coming back to the story of Umar Darda radiallahu anha, I'll just wrap it off and then we'll conclude the lecture. After Abu Darda radiallahu anha passed away, she was a lady, remember, she was a lady, a very beautiful lady from a noble family, and she was extremely knowledgeable. She was known as an alima, a female scholar. She was well-versed in fiqh, in jurisprudence. Some of the sahaba used to go to her and learn from her. Allahu Akbar. She was such a lady, and after her husband's death, one of, during the Khilafah of Muawiyah, he sends, he proposes to marry her. The caliph proposes to marry her. And at that time, it wasn't a, a, a big deal, you know. Today, the widows are considered taboo. Nobody wants to marry a widow. In those days, it was something normal. The minute someone passes away, there's someone else to marry. This was how beautiful. Halal was easy, haram was difficult. But now, haram has become easy and halal has become complicated and difficult. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all of us. So he sends the proposal to marry her. And you know what she says? You know what she says? She replies back saying, I'm sorry, I can't marry you. I can't accept your proposal because I am currently engaged to Abu Darda radiallahu I'm currently engaged to Abu Darda radiallahu Why? Because she's waiting to marry him in Jannah. Allahu Akbar. You saw the love, you saw the mercy in between them because my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, their relationship was based on taqwa. Their relationship was based on the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The minute we base all of our endeavors in our lives upon the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, upon taqwa, upon fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will be successful in this world as well as the hereafter. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all to attain taqwa. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all of our sins. May He accept our good deeds. May He alleviate the sufferings that the Muslim ummah is going through. May He alleviate the sufferings of our brethren in Gaza. May He accept the shuhada from them and may He have mercy upon all of them. And may He have mercy upon all of us too. May He bless the beautiful bond of marriage that is about to take place in a few minutes. May He bless the two spouses. May He fill their hearts with pure love for one another. May He make their marriage last for an eternity. May He help, may He make them help one another in attaining the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may he, may he, the Almighty, bless them with beautiful, obedient children who will be a coolness to their eyes. May He forgive all of our sins. And may He, the Almighty, just as how He united us here this evening, it is raining and we are making dua. Our duas will be answered. Have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May He unite us in the gardens of Jannah with our beloved Master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.